Hello friends. Thank you for checking out our YouTube channel. My name is Justin and I'm one of the pastors at One Life Church. One Life is a church family committed to bringing the kingdom of Jesus to earth, one life at a time through intentional relationships. Now, before we jump into the sermon, I wanna ask you to do two things. First, hit that subscribe button so that you can follow along with what God is doing in and through One Life Church. Second, in the description below, you will find a link for onelifechurch.tv. This is where you can learn more about our church. If you live in the Concord, North Carolina area, I wanna invite you to join us in person on a Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. You can plan that visit at onelifechurch.tv. I pray that today's sermon encourages you to continue following the person of Jesus in your everyday life. Let's dive in. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> So <laughs> I was thinking the other day, and actually I was just reminded during that announcement video because I did not see the kid dismissal until y'all did, um, that uh, we as a church are a quirky bunch, <laughs> and I love it. Um, you know, we have our own culture. We have our own music. We have our own kind of... Um, style and traditions of doing things. And um, I was thinking this week about how we kind of even have our own language. And you might have heard this called uh, Christianese before. It's these certain words in certain ways that we use that you're probably not going to find anywhere outside of the church. So like words like fellowship or loving on or my personal favorite, Hedge of protection. <laughs> Whenever I hear somebody pray that, I promise I'm like really trying to focus, but I always imagine like the person being prayed over, like covered, like surrounded by shrubbery and evil's like, oh no, a box would run away. <laughs> like, it just cracks me up every time. <laughs> but another one of these Christianese words that we have is discipleship. And it's not that there's anything like wrong with the term exactly. It's just that we've used it in so many different ways to mean so many different things that the true meaning of the word has kind of gotten a little convoluted. Like when I was in college, we had discipleship groups, which were these groups of people you were assigned to be with and you hung out with once a week for 20 minutes instead of going to chapel and you never spoke to each other again. That's, that's not really what discipleship groups are meant to do. I've been told to get myself in a discipleship relationship with somebody before. And as Justin alluded to last week, it doesn't always work like that. Like, hey, will you disciple me? Okay, and then you're good to go. It's not like that. I've heard a lot of sermons on discipleship that really were more about evangelism. And then I've heard sermons on discipleship that were really more about spiritual formation. And it's just become confusing. So what gives? Why do we have so many different, I can't even talk this morning, definitions, uses, interpretations of this word, discipleship? Why does this concept confuse so many people? And it leads to like when we find out, oh, we're doing a discipleship series. I know a lot of people get frustrated or they're apathetic or they just are like, well, here's another discipleship initiative. It's not going to work. And then it falls flat. Why is it so hard? And I have a theory on why that is. Why trying to do discipleship in 2024 or 21st century is so difficult. And it's because the example of discipleship that we have from the Bible is from another time, another culture, even another religion. It is next to impossible to replicate first century discipleship in 21st century America. And here's what I mean, okay? So let's take our 242 groups, right? Now, I love our 242 group ministry. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of like the 
pastor over groups, so I kind of have to, but no, I really do. Like I love our 242 groups ministry and I think they function really well and our groups are thriving. Now, in case you have forgotten or you've never been told, so they're called 242 groups because they come from Acts 242. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to the fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. And that's what we're trying to model in our discipleship environment. And that actually seems really doable. And our groups are doing this very thing well. But see, that's only the first verse of that section on what discipleship looked like in the first century church. You ready for the rest of it? A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Okay, so we're already not doing signs and wonders here. And could you guys imagine if we advertised our group's ministry that way? Like, okay, guys, get, let's gear up. We're starting a discipleship group's ministry. Here's what we're going to need you to do. Okay, first, y'all need to go and sell all your property, sell all your possessions, and then just bring the money here. Okay, and we're going to give it away. Just give it away to people. Then all the stuff you have left, bring it here too, and we're just going to distribute it to everybody. So we just all have the same kind of stuff, make sure everybody's got what they need. And then you're going to come here every single day for worship. And then we're going to have a rotation for whoever's cooking dinner for everybody. It's going to be great. Now, don't get me wrong. I love y'all and I'd love to hang out with every day. And I mean, like who doesn't love a good commune? But in our culture, those kinds of groups don't necessarily like enjoy the goodwill of all the people as much as they attract the attention of the FBI. (laughs) It's just not quite where we are. But it was possible back then because the people lived much more localized lives. You see, just about everybody worked from home. Even the merchants would live above their shops. The fishermen would live right by the water. The farmers would live on their land. and Everybody was really close together. So their communities and their culture, they were much more communal minded because in their culture, hospitality wasn't just like a suggestion of a nice thing to do. Hospitality was a command, a law in their culture. You took care of each other because just about everybody in their community was related in some way. Kids were raised by all the adults of the town. And the temple and the synagogue, don't think of them as just like our churches. They're not. They weren't just places of worship. They were actually like the hubs of their society where people would go, yes, to pray and offer sacrifices and worship, but also where people would meet and they would work and they would eat together and they'd play music and discuss religion and politics. And I guess it would be kind of like our coffee shops or something like that. You could find anything going on in the synagogue or the temple. My my point is, this kind of discipleship was possible for the early Christians because it fit into their lives, into what they were already doing. They didn't start a whole new culture. They adapted it and incorporated discipleship or just incorporated being apprentices of Jesus into the way they were already living their lives. Now, remember I said that because I'm going to come back to it. So, all right. So what about the disciples of Jesus? Why is it so hard for us to truly feel like we can kind of experience that personal discipleship with Jesus? It's kind of the same thing. And it's what Justin talked about last week. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. And Jewish rabbis had disciples. And these disciples didn't meet with their rabbi for coffee every other Tuesday at 10 (laughs) a.m. 
They didn't. They met, they lived with their rabbi. They would follow him everywhere they went. They would watch him. They slept beside him. They ate with him. They traveled with him. It wasn't just this formal study of Torah, but it was this holistic approach to shaping the way a person lived, a way they behaved, thought, and taught to be just like that of their rabbi. And I think this is at the heart of why discipleship can seem so confusing and so overwhelming. Because we're so distant from that original culture and context of discipleship that we've unintentionally altered its meaning. We've turned discipleship into a verb. We say things like, who are you discipling? Who is discipling you? You need to work on your personal discipleship. And that just kind of makes it feel like a task, right? And fun fact, discipling is not a word. Microsoft Word tells you that. It's like underlined in red. It's because disciple is not a verb. It's a noun. A disciple is a follower, an apprentice, a student. A disciple is something you are, not something you do. We don't say, hi, I'm Carrie, and I'm wifing Paul, who husbands me. Or we're like, who are you doddering? How's your fathership going? Oh, my mothership is struggling really, really, really bad right now because my kids aren't kidding me like they're supposed to. You see, being a disciple, it's an identity. It's something so close to your soul that you wouldn't be you without it. And I want to share with you today on why it's so important to think about disciple as a verb, excuse me, verb, not a noun, because it's not just semantics. If we keep thinking that discipleship is something that we can do to someone or someone can do to us, then it continues to put the responsibility of a person's spiritual growth on someone else. Like, I'm not growing because my pastor is not discipling me. Because if, if we believe that disciple is something that we are, and we are disciples of Jesus, he is our teacher, then that means that nobody can disciple us but Jesus himself. Which is both challenging and really freeing at the same time. And what makes it challenging is that it means that not everyone is a disciple. You see, in the Gospels, not counting the religious leaders and the Romans, we see two distinct groups of people who interact with Jesus. So we have the crowds and we have the disciples. And the crowds usually show up for major teachings like the Sermon on the Mount or big miracles like the feeding of the multitude. And a lot of times they'll hear something about what Jesus did and they'll like hunt him down and find him. And they could be pushy about it. Luke 5 says that they like pressed in on Jesus to hear his teaching like he was a rock star or something. You see, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, the crowds were the ones waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna. But the crowds also tried to force Jesus to be a king. The crowds abandoned Jesus when he didn't do another huge miracle. The crowds may have shouted Hosanna, but the crowds also five days later shouted crucify him. The crowds were fickle. They were just kind of fans of him, and then it wasn't going their way. They're like, peace out. I got my own life to live. But then there were the disciples. And I'm talking about the 12 plus Zebedee and Mary Magdalene and Salome and Cleopas and Mary, Martha and Lazarus and several others who are named throughout the Gospels. These were the ones who walked with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They talked with him and sat at his feet and learned from him. They asked him questions when they were confused and they did not abandon him when the crowds did. And a great example of this is John chapter six. Jesus had just fed the multitude of people and the multitude comes back the next day wanting more food. And so Jesus takes this opportunity to preach one of his most difficult sermons in the entire gospels. This is where we get where I'm the bread of life. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. It was a difficult teaching. 
and the crowds could not handle it. And that day, the Bible tells us that many in the crowds turned their back on Jesus and walked away. And then we see this conversation with the disciples. In John 6, 67, Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? And Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. The disciples were truly devoted to Jesus, even when it was hard, even when it didn't make sense. Even when the crowds turned their backs, the disciples stayed faithful because they knew Jesus. They believed him and they followed him wherever he led. And that is what it means to be a disciple. In the book, Practicing the Way, John Mark Comer, he compiles some statistics and he concludes that while 63% of Americans consider themselves Christians, if you look at actual practice and actual behavior, only about 4% of that number could be considered disciples. Yeah, 4% of 63%. And I don't do math, but that's not a lot. <laughs> And he points out the reason, and it's because Western churches have intentionally or non-intentionally created kind of this two-tier system where there are Christians. These are people who have converted to Christianity. They've been baptized. They claim Jesus as Lord. And then there's like the discipleship track, which is kind of like a bonus level of Christianity, right? These are like the special Christians, they take the classes and they lead the things and they go to the meetings. And look, I promise there are no secret special Christians meetings here at One Life. You're not missing out on anything. But see, Jesus literally never said that. Literally, he did not say that. He never envisioned a two-tier system. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told the apostles, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's called the Great Commission. And you're not going to find in scripture a sort of okay commission. Becoming disciples is our goal. It's our identity. John Mark Comer defines it this way. He says, if an apprentice is simply anyone whose ultimate aim is to be with Jesus in order to become like him and live the way Jesus would live if he were in their shoes, then a non-apprentice is simply anyone whose ultimate aim in life is anything else. So before we move any further in this series, I'm going to challenge you to ask yourself a tough question. Do I want to be a disciple? And be honest. Because listen, it's just statistics. There's going to be some no's in this room. Your answer is going to determine the attitude you have as we go through the rest of this series and as we go through this in our 242 groups later. And listen, I'm not shaming anyone. I'm not judging anyone. Because it's better to, to name it and to try and understand the resistance rather than just like ignoring it or just getting frustrated about all this. You see, I don't want you to tune out though and think, well, I'm a no, so I'm never doing this. There's no point in me even coming. No. Because here's something really cool. John 7, 5 tells us that even Jesus's own brothers were no's at first. They did not follow him during his ministry. But something changed in them by Jesus's resurrection. Because right before Pentecost, when the church began, Acts 1.14 tells us, they all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. A no does not have to be a no forever. So keep an open mind. Give yourself a chance to learn what it really, really means to be an apprentice of Jesus. Okay, so I said 
thinking of disciple as a noun, not a verb is challenging and freeing. And I talked about the challenge. So what about the freedom? And this is what I find so freeing because being a disciple rather than doing discipleship, it's an invitation to a way of life rather than just a list of tasks. That's it. You're not going to get a guide from us on 20 simple steps to becoming a disciple of Jesus. We're not going to ask you to come back next Sunday with a list of five people you're going to disciple. You are not going to get a checklist of action steps that promises to turn you into a disciple in eight weeks or less. It is a process. It takes time. Even the disciples of the ancient rabbis did not become true disciples on the first day. It took years. So we are going to take a holistic approach, much much like the approach of those early rabbis. And instead of tasks, we're going to go with goals, signposts for us to reach toward. And there are three goals. And the three goals of our apprenticeship to Jesus are to be with Jesus, become like him, and do as he did. So how are we going to start doing that? So throughout this series, we're going to go into lots more details on these goals. And once you get to your, the study in your 242 groups, you're going to go even deeper. So today, we're just going to step back to a 10,000 foot view and get kind of the big picture here. So there's this scene as we've been thinking about this. Um, and when Jesus, or when Jesus, Justin was preaching last week. Um, and he was talking about the disciples of Jesus. This was a scene from The Chosen that just kept playing in my mind, and I knew I wanted to share it this week. So it's from season one, from my personal favorite episode of The Chosen, the wedding episode. Uh, Jesus has just called his first disciples, and they're about to go to, or they're at the wedding of Cana, where he does his first public miracle. And this conversation takes place right before the miracle happens while the disciples are just hanging out and talking or fellowshipping, if you want to use Christianese. (laughs) So Simon, Peter, and Andrew are going to be on the left side of the table, and Mary Magdalene, little James, and Thaddeus are on the right side of the table. Now, remember, The Chosen has some fictionalized parts like this one, but I am sure conversations like this happen. So we're going to watch this and then talk about it. They have no idea who sits before them. (laughs) To be a child again, yes? I think we are the lucky ones. They have to go home with their parents tonight. We get to stay with him and his mother. Where will that be? Who knows? With him, I have learned to stop worrying about those things. I haven't. It's cold in this region. Do you think he would let you freeze? My brother has many worries. I keep reminding him of when our Abba taught us how to fish. We just sat there and watched until we became fishermen. Mm. We will watch him. And watch and watch and watch. Forever, I think. I'm going to get more wine. Get two. (laughs) I don't even know why I'm here. It's usually the students that choose the rabbi, not the other way around. And I'm not even a student. Neither was I. Thaddeus introduced me to him. How did you meet? (laughs) On a uh, construction job in Bethsaida. He hasn't exactly been picking the best and brightest students. What? He works? Well, until recently. He's not a professional rabbi. Yeah, but I thought he has no home and no job. No permanent home. He's a stonemason. Like you. A craftsman. He taught as well. He asked me to follow him. He said he was building a kingdom fortress stronger than stone. I believed him. What were you building in Bethsaida? <laughs> uh, uh, a public amenity. An aqueduct? No, uh, but something uh, humbler. What then, man? It's, it's not proper to say in front of a woman. I have seen and heard things that would turn your blood to ice. A latrine? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, ice? Yes. 
Our master building a privy. A job <laughs> is a job. I've, I was cutting stone for the retaining wall. He, he was building a ramp of cedar planks so the crippled and the elderly could get to it without climbing the steep steps. But well, why didn't he heal them so they could mount the steps themselves? He's always saying his time has not yet come. Calling your name, the catch of the fish. Why was it his time for miracles then and not others? Because those were private. He, he hasn't shown his signs to, to others publicly yet. What's keeping him from making his ministry public? The wind blows to the south or to the east and you cannot say why. A latrine. <laughs> yeah, we better not spread that around. He doesn't hide where he's from. Oh. Don't tell Andrew. That room. Yeah, he'll be surprised. <laughs> I love that scene. I love that whole episode. Man, there's so much good stuff here. So first, they were with Jesus at a wedding where there was joy and music and dancing and wine. You see, they didn't give up fun just because they were following Jesus. In fact, Jesus is the one who invited them to the wedding. And I kind of love that. Like one of the first things Jesus does with his fledgling group of disciples is to take them to a wedding celebration. Like, come follow me. And he, they're like, where? And he's like, to the party. We just spent like a whole week talking about that in Summer Jam. <laughs> Next, did you catch what they were talking about at first? They were talking about how they were going to learn from him. And Simon says, remember when we were first learning to fish, we watched our father. And then one day we became fishermen. I see, that's what apprentices did. They would watch their master for years and they learned from the master's actions. There was very little direct instruction with apprenticeships. The disciples were going to become like Jesus by spending time with him, by watching him and then learning from what he did. And all this is happening while Jesus is over there hanging out with the kids, making stacks of wine glasses, which is not in the Bible, but I am sure that is the personality that Jesus had. I love it. Jesus' students were having this conversation independently of him. And if you notice, even though he's not there, they bring up the things that he said, the things that he did. They interpreted it and they discussed it and debated and talked about what it meant to them. All while sitting around a party drinking wine. You see, this is what life as an apprentice looks like. And hopefully you'll start to see how that is actually possible in the 21st century. So first, how are we going to be with Jesus when we can't see or touch him? That is one of the first barriers that I hear people say. Well, the disciples just had Jesus right there. I don't. So we're going to start with something really simple. We can be with Jesus because the people who were with Jesus, who did walk with him, left us an account of his life and his words. Oh no, here comes the Bible reading plan. No, promise, no. Um, I'm actually gonna be completely honest with you. This is totally true story. Um, <clears throat> I'm 40 years old and I have never once in my life completed a Bible reading plan. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. I love the Bible, but I don't love structure and I don't love people telling me what to read. <laughs> so I cannot commit to something that structured long term. And I am a firm believer that I can't tell y'all to do something that I can't do myself or something that I don't enjoy doing myself. So here is what I'm going to propose, okay? There are three chapters in the Bible that give us the closest picture of what it would have felt like to sit at Jesus's feet and learn from him. It's Matthew 5 through 7. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to know how to become like Jesus and do as he did, it's in there. They're his words. It's the longest sermon of his we have recorded verbatim. And it's already going to be familiar to you. Because we recite part of it every single week here. And another part of it is our discussion question. And it's pretty much a unanimous consensus that this is the greatest sermon ever preached. And it's not boring or confusing. 
So you have the Bible on your phones. You have the Bible in paper. And if you're like me and you cannot stand to read the Bible on your phone, true story. I have actually done something. So in the back, I have made copies of the Sermon on the Mount and they're like tiny, it's little pocket sized. And I printed lines on the other page. Take one. It'll fit in your pocket if you're a guy. If you're a woman, it won't because you know how it is. Um, <laughs> so, but <laughs> it'll fit in your purse um, or on your Stanley if you're one of those. Anyway, uh, but take it with you. Pull it out when you're waiting somewhere instead of pulling out your phone. Okay, anytime you think you're waiting in the car rider line or you're waiting for your oil to be changed or something, just pull this out and read it. And spend time with Jesus. And I also have to say, um, if you do take one of those, I don't know what happened. The page numbers are all wrong, but the words are in the right order. It was, I, I, it is a mystery. <laughs> so I checked it a bunch of times. But bring this practice of being with Jesus into the things you're already doing. Walk with Jesus in the places you're already going. And it's so foundational. And I really think it's so important because we can't become like Jesus and act like Jesus. Those second two goals. If we don't know Jesus, if we don't know his words, if we don't know what he did, we can't become like with him, him, if we don't know him. And so it's important that we read his words and the words of those who walked alongside him. And speaking of those who walked alongside Jesus, I want to go back to what I said about the disciples at the wedding. They're having a spiritual conversation while hanging out together at a party. You see, when we talk about discipleship relationships, that's what we're talking about. It's not always about you becoming a rabbi to someone else. It's about finding your people as you seek to follow Jesus together walking side by side as you follow the rabbi, as you follow our savior. And there's this concept in Judaism that went along with being an apprentice. And it's one we see all over the New Testament, even if we don't explicitly see this word, because it's in Hebrew. And it's a Hebrew word called um, havarim. And havarim means friends. Havar is the Hebrew word for friend. And if you see I am at the end, that's like their S, so that's their plural. So Havari means friends. There's an old rabbinic saying from Jesus's time that goes, acquire for yourself a rabbi and get yourself a Haver. You need some Havari. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. In the Havarim, in the friends relationship, it's not about one person going around sharpening the iron of everybody else. These friendships are mutually encouraging. You learn from each other. You feel support from them and you feel like you're able to support them with wisdom and with love. These are the people who can come to you when they need help and you can come to them when you need help. Remember how I said I would come back to the thing I said in the beginning about how the first Christian church worked the way it did because it fit into the culture they already had? That's what I'm talking about here. These are people that you would be spending time with anyway. These are people that you are probably already on a group text with. It's not necessarily anyone leading anybody else, but all of you leading each other as you become apprentices to Jesus. And listen, if you don't have that, talk to any of us on staff and we will help you find those people. Because our apprenticeship, it's not a never-ending task list or lofty goals intended to just make us feel guilty or like failures. You see, we know it's possible to become a disciple or an apprentice of Jesus because that's the command he gave us in the Great Commission. There is no plan B. But we don't have to do it alone. And we have the son of God as our teacher, as our master, our Lord. 
Jesus asks us to follow him because he wants to be with us. He wants to show us a new way to be human, to live our lives with purpose and with joy and relationship with others who want that same life of transformation and interacting with the world in the same way that Jesus did. This is possible. We can become apprentices of Jesus and we can do it together.